cerebrum. This is the largest portion of the human brain. It consists of two cerebral hemispheres. This is one here, and here's the other one, two cerebral hemispheres. The, the hemisphere has a cortex, which is gray matter. You know, the gray matter contains the nerve cell bodies, unmyelinated axons, dendrites, neuroglial cells, but doesn't contain myelinated fibers. It is in the white matter that myelinated fibers are located. You can see that in the section here. So look at the cortex. This is the cortex. This is gray matter. And then deep to it is the white matter. The two cerebral hemispheres, they are separated from each other by this fissure, longitudinal cerebral fissure. If you have the dissected brain, you can see that you can separate between them. It's a very deep fissure. You can see it here. It's the longitudinal cerebral fissure. Now, as we have noticed that the surface of the brain is not smooth. The cortex and the surface of the brain is not smooth. It is convoluted and is folded upon itself. And obviously, this folding, like the villi and the microvilli, it is to increase the surface area. The convex part is called the gyrus, and the part that is hidden is called the sulcus. If it is a deep sulcus, then it is a fissure. So you can see a fissure here, and then it has sulci. So there is a sulcus, sulci, and gyri, and a deep fissure. Sulci and gyri. Gyri are the folds, the sulci are grooves, and the fissures are the deep grooves. They increase the surface area of the cerebral cortex. In the cerebral cortex, we have all these sensory, motor areas, and association areas, intelligence, personality, judgment, all taking place in the cerebral cortex. So we, we need a very big cerebral cortex. In fact, it has been mentioned that two-thirds of the cerebral cortex is hidden in the sulci and the fissures of the brain. What you see on the surface of the brain is only one-third of this cerebral cortex. The white matter inside the cerebral cortex, you can see a dissection here, dissecting the white matter. You can see bundles of axons. It's, it's of three types. They are either association fibers, as the name indicates, they connect gyri in the same hemisphere, like for example, this one and this one. Or we have commissural fibers. These commissural fibers, they cross from one hemisphere to another. When there is a decussation, they are commissural fibers. And the third type of fibers are projection fibers. So they either project up, and these are the sensory fibers, or they project down, and they are these are motor fibers. And this is a mid-sagittal section of the entire brain. And there is an area here, a very big part, a very big body, a corpus, which is only formed of fibers crossing from one cerebral hemisphere to another. And this is called the corpus callosum. This is the biggest collection of commissural fibers in the central nervous system. In this coronal section, you can see here, this is the longitudinal cerebral fissure. So when you open the longitudinal cerebral fissure, you will not be able to detach the hemispheres one from, from the other because they are connected here by the corpus callosum. For descriptive purposes, we divide the cerebrum into lobes, and these lobes, fortunately, they have the same name of the bones of the skull. So we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. You can see them here. So these are the lobes of the uh, brain. Between the frontal and the parietal lobe, there is a very characteristic sulcus, which is this one. They call it the central sulcus, and this is an important sulcus, not only because it is useful as a landmark be between the frontal and parietal lobes, this is the frontal lobe and this is the parietal lobe, but because the gyrus in front of it and the gyrus behind it, they serve important functions. So the one in front of it, it serves for motor function, and the one behind it, it serves for sensory function. If you are asked to name these gyri, then what are you going to name this gyrus, which is in front of the central sulcus? Precentral gyrus, easy. And the other one is the postcentral gyrus. So the precentral gyrus is located in the frontal lobe, and it is what we call it the primary motor area. It is from here that parts of the corticospinal pathway arises. The fibers that descend down to the spinal cord and control 
voluntary motor activity. And this is the sensory cortex, the primary sensory, or uh, we call it somesthetic area. It receives sensations like pain, touch, temperature, vibration, pop proprioception, pressure. So all these sensations are received in, in this area. And then we have another sulcus here, which is called the lateral sulcus. And this separates between the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. Posteriorly, we have the occipital lobe. The, dip, the separation between the occipital and parietal lobe is not clear on the lateral surface of the brain. But if we go to the medial surface of the brain, this is the medial surface, you can see that there's a very clear sulcus here between the parietal and occipital lobe. So that's why they call it the parieto occipital sulcus. So that's how we differentiate between these two lobes, parietal lobe and occipital lobe, parieto occipital sulcus. And again, you can see part of the central sulcus here, but most of the central sulcus is present on the lateral surface of the brain. Now, can you see this structure that is looks like hidden, this part? This is a hidden part of the cerebral cortex. How can we reach this part? We have to separate the lateral sulcus. We separate the frontal and parietal lobes from the temporal lobe, and then we can see the, this hidden part of the brain. This hidden part here, that's the hidden part. We have removed part of the frontal lobe here. We have removed part of the temporal lobe here. And so we can see that there is an island of cerebral cortex hidden in the depth of the lateral sulcus. So that's why they call it the insula. Insula means island. Actually, it, they are still investigating its function, but um, many textbooks, they attribute to it functions like visceral sensation, taste, balance. These are some of the functions of this insula. You can see it here. Uh, this is a coronal section. I'm cutting the brain like this and looking at it from this side. That's my eye. So that's a coronal section. You can see the the longitudinal cerebral fissure now, the corpus callosum, that is the lateral sulcus here and lateral sulcus there. And if you separate this lobe from this lobe, then you will be able to see the insula. Here, that's the insula. As I mentioned that the cerebral cortex has different functions. Now we know that there are sensory areas. An example is the post-central gyrus. Uh, there is a motor area, an example is the primary motor area, which is located in the pre-central gyrus. But in addition to that, there are multiple other areas. They are attributed as association area. They are not motor, they are not sensory. They, they are used for functions like integration, emotion, reasoning, judgment, personality, and so on. One of these large association area is located here. It's called the prefrontal cortex. I'm not sure if you have heard of this case, the case of Phineas Gage, uh, the guy who has a metal rod penetrating his frontal lobe, and he suffered from personality changes. If not, then it's a good idea to go through this video, five-minute video, and have an idea. It's, it's a, a very interesting case in, in the medical history. The, this guy has a lot of personality changes after what happened to him resulting in destruction of his prefrontal cortex. He didn't lose his sensations, he didn't lose, uh, probably he had a blindness in one eye, but he didn't lose his motor activity or sensory activity elsewhere apart from vision, but he suffered personality changes. This is another uh, concept relating to the speech and language areas. So speech and language involve sensory and association and motor cortices. So the sensory cortices here, we have this cortex, which is located in the temporal lobe. It is called the primary auditory cortex. This is where you hear the spoken language. And then we have the primary visual cortex, which is located in the occipital lobe. This is where you read the written language. So there's a sp spoken language and written language. And then these sensations will go to as an association area here, what we call the vernix area, it's located in the border between the temporal and parietal lobes at the posterior end of the lateral sulcus. And it is here 
that the written or spoken language is recognized, understood. So hearing doesn't mean that you understand. Looking at something doesn't mean that you understand what is written. If you are not Japanese, you will not be able to recognize the Japanese characters. You can see them, but you cannot recognize them. So that's the difference between what you hear and you recognize, what you read and recognize. So this is taking place here in the vernix area. And so the vernix area will be connected by association fibers to another area, which is located in the frontal lobe. And this is called Broca's area. This is the motor speech area, Broca's area. These areas, whether Vernix area or the Broca's area, they are located only on one side of the brain. In the cerebral hemisphere, that is called the dominant hemisphere. And the dominant hemisphere is usually the left cerebral hemisphere. It controls the right side of the body. Even in left-handed people, most of them, like 90% of them, their dominant hemisphere is the left. So these areas are not located on both hemispheres. They are only located, the vernix area and the Broca's area, they are only located in the dominant hemisphere. Broca's area is going to plan the speech, the motor part of the speech, and send this plan to be executed by the motor area, which is located in the pre-central gyrus. And the motor area is going to send commands to the tongue, to the diaphragm for respiration, vocal cords, and so the speech is, is formed. So if this area, for example, if this area is destroyed, if vernix area is destroyed, the patient can still speak. He can still hear can still look at the words, but he cannot understand. So if you ask a question to the patient, and probably you will watch this short video here and have a very good idea about what happens, he's going to answer you unrelevant things. We call it word salad, because there is no understanding. This area is affected. And on the other side, if this area, if Broca's area is affected, the patient can understand the reading, can understand what you are talking to him, but he cannot make a speech. Just one point here about what I mentioned about right and left cerebral hemisphere. I said that the left cerebral hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. Dominant doesn't mean that the other hemisphere is inferior. No. Dominant means that it has the language functions. Otherwise, if you look at the other hemisphere, you will find that the other hemisphere has qualities and is serving other functions that probably they are more superior than the dominant hemisphere. So if you look at them, the, the, this hemisphere recognizes or feels the art of music, the art of painting. So it is the, the, it is the artistic hemisphere rather than the dominant hemisphere, which is the language hemisphere. It is the hemisphere for calculation and science. So both hemispheres work together, they are connected to each other by the corpus callosum. Mm -hmm.